welcome to Crocmo TV. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Great to meet you. Good to meet you too. My understanding is you're a local producer. That's correct. Making some noise in the Pittsburgh scene. Doing my best. And so I'm interested to hear, first of all, what brought you to Pittsburgh and kind of how you started producing and what, you know, what, what your sound is and, and what you're working on right now. Uh, well, I moved here initially in May of 2021, and I grew up in York County, about four hours from here, and there's not a whole lot going on there, music-wise, and right, kind of just a lot of cornfields and stuff. York County is like Philly, or no? A little closer. It's about an hour from Philly. Okay. All right. Well, was there not a scene in Philadelphia? Uh, there was. I just had some friends out here, so it was... Pittsburgh seemed more my thing who were those people uh i have a just a couple friends that i went to school with that had moved out here and high school or college high school very cool so pittsburgh was the spot yeah and i moved out here i've been really enjoying it been kind of trying to do some music stuff and meet with people to place beats and stuff yeah, yeah, tell me about that. So how? So when you say place beats, what do you, what exactly do you mean? Like, how does the industry work? Uh, most of the time, it starts from like I'll shoot somebody a message on Instagram that I like their music, and I'll just be tell them, "Hey, we should work, uh, do a track, and see how it turns out." And how often does that work? I'd say. Not as often as I'd like, but <laughs> <laughs> who's the dream? Like, who do you who do you, would you love to work with? What would the dream be? I'd love to do a project for Freddie Gibbs. Like, out of everybody, Ooh, that's cool. Yeah, that would be really fun. Wow, Freddie is like the really deep voice, and he um, was he on the Rogan podcast too? I'm not hundred percent sure. Yeah, he's like the one who keeps it super real. Like, it's. Uh, he does like a lot of like coke rap kind of stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, okay. So what what about the projects that have already happened? Which one was the most exciting? I did a project for Dankery Harv of Frank and Dank. Uh, what? <laughs> wait, wait, wait. We, so we have to talk about the Dilla documentary, right? Oh yeah. This is this is like the Frank and Dank, like Frank and Dank from yeah. Detroit. And are both of them alive or no? Uh yeah. Okay. Cheers. cheers. So. Wow, how did that come into be? That's incredible. That was through the Instagram things too? Yeah, so pretty much over the pandemic, like right after everything shut down, I had all this free time and I figured I'll start taking music a little more seriously now that I have the time to do it. Were you laid off or? Yeah, so I worked uh, for a bus company for a school district. So like they yeah. shut down the schools and. Wow. <laughs> this is in York? Yeah. <laughs> So interesting. Okay, so you were a bus company. You weren't driving a bus. No, I was working in the office, uh, answering phones and stuff. And um, you had already been producing like a bit. Yeah, you, mostly just like working with friends and stuff. And on Ableton or what kind of uh, workstation are you using? So I use a uh, FL Studio a lot. I'll use my 404 sometimes too, but I don't love producing on that. Like the whole beat. Yeah, yeah. The 404 is a drum machine, like 808? Uh, kind of. It's a sampler, so you could like put drum sounds on it. You could record records into it. This uh, is the one I've seen you using on your Instagram? Yeah. It's like it's kind of like a rectangle. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Um, yeah, those videos are great. I think, I guess that's like pretty important for producers now to kind of show the process on social media and whatnot. Oh, definitely. And you've gotten some pretty good feedback. People are excited. It seems like it, yeah. So what's up with No Casino? What is this name about? Are you like uh, protesting the rivers? You want them to shut down or what? what's the deal? No, so there's it, nothing political behind it except there. Uh, organization used to put up signs all over the place back in my hometown. And just something about the phonetics of it sounded cool to me. So I went with it. So no Casino was, was an organization? They just did. They were built, trying to uh, build a casino. And I guess these people really didn't want the casino. <laughs> I could care less either way, but... <laughs> Do you gamble? 
up a little bit. I'll buy a lottery ticket if I'm feeling lucky, but yeah, not the, a whole lot. <laughs> the secret is to buy the ticket when it's not a big jackpot. <laughs> because it's when it's a big jackpot, everybody buys the ticket. Your chances are like nil. Oh, yeah. So you, um, I like the casino. I, I like blackjack. I've been trying to get better, focus my talents, learn all the like uh, basic rules, like basic strategy. Mm-hmm. And then after that, it's card counting, which I haven't gotten to <laughs> yet, but it's... Um, on the horizon. Do you ever go to casinos or no? Not a whole lot. I love playing poker, but oh, cool. I prefer it just like a couple friends sitting around the table. Is there a poker night? You don't have to tell me online. <laughs> just say yes or no. Don't tell me like the night and where it is yet. I don't have anything going on currently, but <sighs> I'd be open to a poker night. <laughs> cool. All right. We could probably do it up here, right? We could put a table in and just don't see have some not. guys over. That'd be really fun. Um, I miss that poker night. I had a, there were some decent ones when I was living in Charleston Okay. that, um, I wasn't, I, know, I wasn't like great, but I always had a great time. So cool. All right. Well, we figured that out. <laughs> That's good. Um, so f- wow. Frank and dang, I'm <laughs> such a big fan. Like, um, geez. And, and you know what? The crazy part is I grew up there. Like I grew up oh, in really? Ann Arbor. Okay. I had no idea this was all going <laughs> down like right right up the street and i think that was kind of the story for a lot of people in the area you know it was very underground oh yeah they were working with q-tip you know they were working with buster rhymes d'angelo quest love tribe uh far side and like we listened i mean we bumped that far side <laughs> album we had lab cab in california was one of the first hip-hop cds that i ever listened to i had no idea all the beats were being made right up the street I mean, I guess I wasn't like heavy in the liner notes, like trying to figure this stuff out. And mm-hmm. the other thing is it was confusing. You know, he had oh, like yeah. eight different names. <laughs> the Uma, the Uma, like was, you know, him, but it was also Tip and it was just confusing. So have you gotten into the business side of things a little bit to try to avoid some of that like mysterious nonsense from happening so you can actually continue to get paid and make sure you get what's yours and everything? Uh, Yeah, so like a lot of times I'll just give people beats for free if they're like somebody i want to work with like if someone's approaching me that i'm not like super involved with the project i'll be like yeah it's this much but if i approach somebody i'll be like yo here's some beats do what you want with them but when you put it out put me as a primary artist on spotify Mm, okay okay does that matter in terms of the royalties down the road uh so it doesn't really change much of the royalties but like when somebody goes to the rapper's page i'll be like directly linked to their page got it got it so you're gonna get more work through it yeah it might not move the needle in terms of like day-to-day financial things yeah but it could get you onto that next project get you connected to the right person whatever yeah that's kind of my logic with it like and it kind of creates an ecosystem on the streaming platforms where it's like okay this person's working with this person and you could kind of creates a web nice okay that's great um yeah i think actually that rap is really exciting right now you know i think there's like this whole drill rap thing which oh, yeah i'm interested in i think it kind of reminds me of grime like it reminds me of like the heavier like uk rap okay. stuff um just in terms of like how aggressive some of the content is and some of the lyrics and um so i'm into that i think it, it'll be fun it definitely does feel like a bit of a su- uh, successor to it so have you done like a full album with anyone yet or are you mostly like doing individual tracks for artists on their projects on their albums uh lately i'm just mostly doing individual tracks that uh tape i did for decory harv i did the whole album oh cool okay and tell me about this artist because i'm not sure i'm not sure this is dank of frank and dank yeah and how did you say the full name dankery hard harv dankery harv yeah his last name's harvey so short (laughs) got it got it okay and did you, was it, were you able to do it all digitally or did you have to go to Detroit? Is, is he still in Detroit or how did it work? So I think he's in Toronto now. Oh, cool. But uh, we were pretty much just emailing files back and forth and over a couple months, we eventually had enough for a whole album. Nice. And with the creative process, are you pretty much sending finished stuff or are people like, yeah, this is cool, but I was wondering if you could make a little change here, add a, little, a couple extra bars for the intro, the chorus, smooth this out here. Like, uh, For the most part, it was just finished stuff. Like a lot of the beats that I'll work on, I'll just sit down and make a beat with nobody in particular in mind. Yeah. And kind of curate based, based off of that 
and like what's what I already have done. So I think I sent him like 50 beats or so over two or three months. Yeah. And then he just sent me back. I think it's an 11 track album. How many beats are there? Like that I have in total? The Yeah. I mean, you sent him 50? <laughs> I have a good bit. Uh, I think the last time I looked on the current computer I'm using, I had like 100, but I know there's more in drives and on thumb drives and yeah 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 what keeps you kind of motivated is it the financial side or is it the creative piece is it both is it the technical side it's definitely creative like i love having the outlet to chop stuff up and put that out like everything i do is a sample base for the most part so it's a lot of like buying records and chopping it up you don't have to be careful about royalties and licensing? I haven't yet, but I figured I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. Like, like the Mac Miller way? Yeah. Nike's <laughs> on my feet. Make this $200 million lawsuit complete? <laughs> no, I figure like if somebody's suing me, then I'm already very successful. So <laughs> I think it's absolutely the way to go. Ask, better to ask for forgiveness than permission. Exactly. And it worked really well for him. Yeah. Um, you know, I think Large Professor was probably in the right in that that song did launch his career. I think most of us probably, that was the first song we heard. It's really sad being in Pittsburgh, involved in the hip-hop community, and having him not be here anymore. No, yeah, it's definitely odd. Like, I wasn't living here when he was alive and putting music out, but I was still a fan, like, I remember back in middle school, kids were wearing Mac Miller shirts and like he was an institution all over Pennsylvania, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, all over the country, all over the world. The, um, you know, for me, it was the festival circuit. He would, he would perform, you know, I saw him at Okeechobee. I saw him at Bonnaroo. I saw him at Lollapalooza. Like he was at every festival for a few summers straight. Oh, yeah. And, and it was a great time, you know, just really brought a, a fantastic show he was like to to me he was to hip-hop what dylan francis was to electronic music oh yeah in terms of just bringing the party and everybody wanted to be part of it and it was a scene so i feel bad you know i, I feel bad for his folks because they're like squirrel held jews so that's kind of where, where i come from too okay you know that's what my dad was it was like squirrel held jew went to alder dice same as wiz and mac and then you know it's a, it's a small community here, so everybody kind of knows his parents, and it sucks. I mean, it kind of connects to the whole, like, fentanyl and um, uh, legalization of drugs to protect people, because if there yeah. was, you know, if there was no war on drugs, then people could just get the drugs they want, and there would be purity and not all this adulterants. No, yeah, there would be some, like, regulation and stuff. Yeah, which, you know, I just came back from Mexico a couple of weeks ago and, you know, you just go in the pharmacy and get what you need. There's not all this paternalistic medicine thing, which, you know, the doctors who I've talked to, oh, for all, in full disclosure, I'm also a doctor, but okay. the, the other doctors that I've talked to are like, you know, that's a terrible idea. You know, <laughs> people are going to kill themselves. And I'm like, people are well, already killing adults. themselves. Exactly. They're adults. You know, like I'm not saying that children should be able to go in there and buy whatever they want, but we have to treat each other. You have to like governments should treat people, their citizens like adults because they are. Oh, yeah. I don't know if that really means that everybody should be able to buy whatever they want, whenever they want. You know, the, the argument that was used was like anti antimicrobial resistance, which is this idea that if everyone is able to get antibiotics whenever they want, that eventually the organisms will become resistant. They won't, the, the antibiotics won't work anymore. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a pretty good argument. You know, does there need to be a gatekeeper? Well, that's what the pharmacist is. <laughs> <laughs> but, but of course, the pharmacist that I met was, uh, you know, it was not at, at the at the pharmacy in, in Tulum was, was not, I don't think it was a real pharmacist. <laughs> <laughs> Just a guy with some drugs. <laughs> <laughs> well, she was, she seemed young, first of all, um, but, you know, not everybody with a white coat is a doctor or a pharmacist. That's the <laughs> lesson today. That's that's my lesson for the day. So um, 
Yeah, I I like your beats. I was listening to a couple just before you got over here, and I was um, thinking I could definitely rap over this. This okay. is this would work. Put one in one of my back on stage uh, playlists on Spotify for next time I you know go to the open mic or decide to start rapping again. Well, you're more than welcome to use whatever you want. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't looking for permission. <laughs> But but thanks. No, there's a that's an interesting piece, right? Is like this this idea that performance probably should be compensated in some way. I mean, how would I feel if I made something and somebody was up on stage yelling over it? I guess it would depend on if I liked them and what they were doing, right? That's kind of my logic with it too. Like, if somebody's up there rapping some offensive stuff, I'm gonna be like. Yeah, bro, you can't be doing that. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. How did you get started? Did you meet somebody who was producing, or you know, what inspired you? Was it all on the internet? I mean, what? Who did you look up to, and who helped you along the way? Was uh, it YouTube tutorials or what? So I'm a little bit self-taught. I've had a couple friends that I grew up with that taught me some stuff. Kind of just a lot of trial and error. I've been like I started playing guitar around eight or nine years old, and then. I was probably like 13 when I first got a copy of FL Studio and just was messing around in it, not doing a whole lot of anything of quality. And it wasn't until probably 2018 or so that I started actually like, okay, I have all this software and I should figure out how to actually use it. And my friend, Chef Miggy, uh, he taught me pretty much a good bit of stuff that I learned early on and just like how to use FL Studio and where everything's located. And I kind of just took that and messed around to try to make it do what I wanted it to do. Very cool. Have you, so since you talk about using instruments, have you messed with Ableton at all or? I haven't. So, uh, I was over at a Picasso spot the one day and I was watching him use Ableton. He is a wizard in it. And I just, I can't wrap my head around it. <laughs> the reason I ask, you know, is because a lot of people say it's better for live performance and recording instruments. And, you know, I've definitely seen some cool stuff with Fruity Loops. That's what I'm going to call it because that's what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, in particular, my buddy Long Arms is one of my favorite producers and he was the guy who I had my band with in Pittsburgh when I was here just doing music from 2009 to 2011. I was also working at UPMC, but <laughs> mostly just doing music. Okay. And, you know, he, he used FL. That was it. So I got to kind of see that. I think the reason I liked it was workflow. What seemed very efficient. Oh, it definitely He is. was able to crank out beats like <laughs> rapid fire. The plugins seemed uh, like plentiful so there's a lot of different instruments that he could get really easily he was able to find a lot of effects oh, that yeah, sounded so good much. um that provided like different levels of intrigue and kind of randomness into the beat to create some variability that kept people listening but mostly the workflow i think you know for the for the live piece, the live performance piece that Ableton would be cool. So maybe that ties in a little bit to these events that you've been throwing. There's some kind of live production events or what are the, what are these shows? Uh, so it's a, I've wanted to do something like it for a really long time. I've been at pretty much ever since I got the SP 404, I've wanted to use that to incorporate some kind of live event with hip hop production. The Grateful Dead's my one of my favorite bands of all time. Oh, cool! <laughs> That's awesome. You're into jam bands a little bit, fish Most, and mostly just the Dead Grateful Dead. And, like I yeah. don't love a whole lot of the jam current jam band scene. Okay, but fish is fun. I like fish. <laughs> yeah. Um. Who else do I like? Um. Twiddle. You know Twiddle. They're they're good. Also good. Um. I'm not like a. I'm, I'm not a big jam band guy either but i, I i'll go oh know, yeah like it's, it's definitely fun to be there and see them you look like a thing. jam band <laughs> <laughs> a little 
but yeah. <laughs> but no, I kind of watching what they do and how they take their music and make it a live experience almost. I kind of wanted to do something like that with hip hop production. And I feel like on the last beat night, I kind of got halfway to where I want it to be. And I could I have some ideas to add a little bit more improvisation to it. Very cool. So so tell me about the event. So where is it? How long has it been going on? And it's called what? Beat Night? Uh, yeah, I just call it a Pittsburgh Beat Night. Cool. And we had the first one at the Government Center last Friday. Which is what? Where is that? It's in the North Shore. It's a record store, bar, coffee shop kind of thing. Nice. Government Center. Sounds like a train stop. Like It sounds <laughs> like, like I'm going to catch the subway. <laughs> I think because that's like actually a, a the name of a subway stop and maybe in Boston or something. But okay. Anyway, okay. So it's a coffee shop, North Shore. Yeah, r- like uh, right on East Street. Okay. But it's a really cool spot, and I we got a couple producers on the lineup. Like we had C Scott played a set, Picasso played a set. Uh, I played with. Sturks, he was using his SP-1200, so he wanted someone up there to play a beat while he was setting up his next beat. Cool. And then we had uh, John Dirt started off the night. Nice, nice. Do you know Edan? It sounds a little familiar. He's the Wiz Khalifa, you know, Rostrum Records guy. Okay. He was also, I think, and I could be getting all the history wrong, but I think he was involved with Strict Flow, too, which was kind of the first hip hop crew out of Pittsburgh to make noise okay. on a national level. The other producers who I know, I'm trying to think there was one who did um, the Wiz record called say, yeah. What was his name? I am say not sure. Yeah. It, it was a uh, better off alone sample where he took the Alice DJ sample. I don't know if I'm familiar better with Better off alone. Would you think you're better off alone? Dun, 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 His name was... Fabiano, Flabiano, Fabiano. I'll look it up. Hang on. Okay. See if you can tell me what happened to this gentleman. Do you think you're better off alone? I need to get a Jamie to Google things for me. <laughs> Let's see. Say yeah, Wiz Khalifa producer. His name is Johnny Giuliano. Oh, I, I, I'm a little familiar with him. E. Dan also got production credits. I think because it was all done at his studio, which okay. was called ID Labs. Okay. Have you heard of ID Labs? Yeah. Okay, so I think ID Lab still exists. I'm pretty sure they do. And it's Edan's studio. And I think it's also where the new Mac Miller mural is. I think so, yeah. Right? It's like Sharpsburg or something like that. Yeah. Okay. I think that's right. I was out there. They People gather there on like the day of his death and things like that. This podcast is kind of dark. <laughs> <laughs> Pittsburgh Sound. Sample of... Happy song by the Dynamic Superiors. Let's see. Give and take Motown, 1977. Wonderful. Wonderful sample by Edan. You got to meet him. It says Brian Holland. So Holland, do you know Holland Dozier Holland? I don't think so, no. That's that's the team of uh, production team behind Motown. Okay. So I was reading Barry Gordy's book, which is great. Uh, my mom actually bought it for me. But he talks about Holland Dozier Holland, this absolute powerhouse of three people that just wrote all the music. You know, one wrote the words, one wrote the melody, the other one did the instrumentation. And it was like an assembly line. That's crazy. Right? He actually worked on an assembly line. And then he took that principle from working on the assembly plant in <laughs> Fo- at Ford and in Detroit and used it to build a record label i think i might have uh, seen a drunk history episode about that <clears throat> yeah i mean it's true though that's really how he did it and it was totally brilliant i mean <clears throat> he uh you know he ditched detroit 
in the in the seventies and went to L.A. and I think a lot of people are resentful about it. But he also was a businessman. Oh yeah, he was. You know, he was the child of of business people. So his parents had a grocery store, and you know he he got the money to start Motown from his family trust. Like there was a a a pool of money that everybody in his family put money down into. And if you wrote a good enough business plan, you could borrow money from the family (laughs) trust. So they had their stuff together. (laughs) Are people making, making bank as you know, in production now that there's, that everything's digital. Can you like, are there people doing, doing well in this world? I think there's like a handful of people that are, Doing well in the classic sense of like make it, bringing in millions of dollars and like living the rock star life, but it's a very small subset. I think most people are spreading themselves across multiple like skills that they would have. Like if you're good at content creation, helping other people with content creation, or like selling studio time, or just any kind of... Uh, yeah. Is that something you're interested in? The studio piece? Like bringing people in and try, trying to make people into rap, better rappers? And I definitely would like to. I don't have a great spot currently to like have people over. Bring but... them on out, man. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. You Always got, down. You got beats, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I got a couple raps. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have a crazy song idea that um, I'm going to put it out here right now. <laughs> Um, just because fuck it. Um, but basically it's called loot drop. So the idea is like, you got all this new stuff. You, you're showing up on my block with your new watch, new kitted out, uh, AR 15, whatever. <laughs> like you got all this, you know, beautiful jewelry, but when it comes down to it, you're just a loot drop. Like I'm, I'm, I'm going to, pick your corpse for your <laughs> for your object i like that idea yeah dripping on my block just a loot drop running from the cops <laughs> turn into a loot drop something like that so eventually maybe a studio where you can bring people in and have them kind of build out their kind of or sell studio time right yeah you wouldn't really care what they did i guess yeah like if someone's paying me i'm just there to have the space to run the equipment but like i'd also like to bring people in like i like doing projects where i put a beat tape together pretty much and then get a bunch of different rappers on each of the beats and like static selecta yeah is that something you've done yet i did like an ep like that probably for my second release and then right after i moved here i put out a whole album like that i'm currently working on another one that's gonna feature all pittsburgh artists oh all right so I'm very excited for that, but who do you have on it so far? I don't want to give away too much, but uh I do I've been sitting on a shout out Lee song for a while that uh cool is gonna be on it. Have you been going in and kind of like looking for local talent and young rappers and people to work with? Like where where are the shows happening? Uh I try to go to as much as I can. I definitely miss a lot of stuff that I want to go to, but Spirit's a really good place to be seeing any kind of Hip hop, or they're bringing out Homeboy Sandman. I know. I really want to go. You're going? That. Hopefully. Got tickets? <laughs> Not yet, but I'll be there. Yeah, I got my tickets. I actually took photos of him performing in South Florida. Okay. More than seven years ago. I was in medical school from 2014 to 2018. So it was around then, probably 2015, 16, something like that. So it's been a grip. I actually just discovered him when he, uh, put out that last album he put out I okay get the name of it but it's got like a barbed wire looking wreath kind of thing on the album cover i haven't heard any of the new albums at all i really like his stuff though no yeah he's really good so when i saw rb was putting that event together i was very excited yeah so wait who's rb he uh runs make sure you have fun yeah, yeah, yeah. is he not pittsburgh because he was messaging me like after i posted something about the show i'm like yeah like um show looks fun whatever like posted the flyer three days later he hits me like yo did you post something like (laughs) 
what was it about? Because they throw <laughs> so many shows, and they're not just Pittsburgh. I think he's in Connecticut, and like yeah, I think he lived here initially or yeah. for a while, and moved to Connecticut yeah, more yeah. recently. Oh, okay, okay, that makes sense. And then Justin is, I think, the local who's actually like putting some of this stuff together. No, yeah, I know they do uh, some stuff together. I'm not a hundred percent on the logistics of it, but yeah. So I wonder where else, other than Spirit, where else I would go. You know, when I was here, it was Shadow Lounge was the okay. spot. Um, I actually remember seeing Wiz, and and well, Wiz was a different story. But I would see Mac at the Shadow Lounge doing what was, what was called Rhyme Calisthenics. I don't remember who threw that kind of event, but it would be like a emceeing challenge where they would put up uh, this big spinner and you'd spin it, and it okay. was like take na- take words out of a hat. <laughs> Uh, rhyme about you know something random uh, rhyme over a beat acapella you know battle and sort of like whatever it was you'd have to do and this i think there was a competition element as well but that was rhyme calisthenics and it was at the shadow lounge which was east liberty yeah no i've heard so many stories about the shadow lounge unfortunately i had never got the opportunity to go but yeah 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 ava was the connected spot too so i had um selecta on the podcast um nah maybe last week okay and so he had some good stories about the those those good old days he was the (laughs) dj that i would always see um at those spots so (sighs) but no i really like uh where's the place Trace Brewing has a, they do a cypher kind of thing that Reason runs. And hmm. Oh, I like Reason. It's it's a really cool event. Like yeah. Just a very open format kind of bunch of dudes in a circle rapping. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where Where is uh, Trace Brewing? That's uh, in Bloomfield. Okay, that'd be easier. Um, I like that. Yeah, Reason always seemed like, um, like a legit stand-up kind of character says that he's got more time to kind of focus on his music lately so i'm excited for that and um i saw him most recently at my buddy jack wilson's show which was at brillo box you ever heard of jack wilson i haven't i've heard of brillo box but yeah yeah jack um let's see what happens if i restart restart the stream so um, Jack was an MC in Pittsburgh when I was here at Pitt. So I was here at Pitt from 2005 to 2009. And then again, I was here again, 2009 to 2011 working UPMC, but mostly DJing. Okay. And so Jack was, you know, he came out of the poetry slam scene. So he always had that strong, commanding voice, really good, hard hitting lyrics. Um, he was in New York for a long time. I think he still is. I think he moved to Brooklyn and he stayed, but um yeah i was uh definitely a fan okay still am and he of course you know when he comes here and does those shows you you get to meet a lot of local people that you wouldn't have met otherwise so yeah that's the one thing i really like about going to shows is there's really a tight-knit community here and it's really cool going to just see a random dj one night and walk it in and know and like half the people there <laughs> yeah totally yeah i got that feeling last night at goldmark for sure wheezy wayne uh chad dj climax nugget zach everybody was out last night <laughs> everybody i even stopped at goldmark like early in the day bro oh <laughs> uh, really you were there too i stopped in at like six thirty for a beer <laughs> nice yeah they've got drafts now Oh, yeah, it's great. Um, yeah, definitely the move. Let's see. So let's see what else. So you play guitar on some of the productions or most of the productions? I actually don't really do a whole lot of mixing, me playing instruments and making beats. A lot of my production is strictly like pulling samples off records. Which is like, where are you getting the records? Or are you doing YouTube or uh-huh. mostly buying stuff? I mostly buy stuff like I'll record off of Spotify sometimes if I find something that I really need to sample and don't have, but I'll go to like Jerry's a lot. I go to the government center a good bit. 
Oh, cool. Okay, you can um, you can use Soul Seek. You get flax a little bit, yeah. Yeah, you want to get that lossless audio? Don't don't play around with them Spotify samples. <laughs> it probably doesn't make a difference, you know. When you think about it, it's um, it's going to get processed through so many different levels of layers of, uh, you know, digitization, and eventually. Yeah it's going to come out in somebody's speaker. They're going to be listening to this at 128 kilobytes <laughs> per second. If we're lucky, you know, 48 is probably the, the more realistic truth. And, um, you know, my voice still sounds amazing. At 48. <laughs> I'm telling you. So, um, yeah, it probably doesn't matter. I think the most important thing is content, right? It's like quality. It's, it's ideas. Yeah. I, I kind of agree with that. Like the arrangement and, how well the beat is put together matters above all else. Like you had dudes in the nineties with vinyl that crackled so bad. You could barely hear the actual music exactly. flipping beats off of that. And it sounded great. Are you, have you been changing the way that you're putting the beats together at all lately? Like, is there anything that you're planning on doing differently or it's kind of things are, you got it figured out. It's kind of locked in right now. Uh, kind of a little bit of both. I, uh, work within a similar framework and workflow most of the time when it's just like finding a sample, chopping it up, finding drums for it. But I'm always trying to expand like my song structure and arrangement and experiment with different effects and how I can bangle samples. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you have to like disguise them a bit, right? Yeah. So, what are the what are the secrets? Is it reversing or like changing the time? Like what what beats the AI algorithms? Are they using AI to detect these now, or is it just I think so? Like algorithms. I know I'll post a beat on TikTok, and half the time it gets taken down. Wow. Like Instagram's fine with it most of the time, but huh. whatever TikTok's using is crazy. The <laughs> Chinese government is what they're using. <laughs> wow. But uh, a lot of times, just pitching it down will get skirt the AI. Hmm. And I do a lot of like I'll chop two beat sections out of a song just like across the entire two, three minute song and rearrange that. And most of the time, unless it's a really distinct song with like distinct sound design and stuff, you can't really pick out what it's from. Yeah. Are you um, does it matter like 33, 45, like you'll grab anything at for the most part, yeah. if, it, if it works, you have a turntable at home, or what do you? Yeah, but that's part of the studio. Yeah, I uh, pretty much just run my turntable right into my either my SP four hundred four or my Scarlet, and yeah. yeah, chop it up in FL Studio, bounce it back out to the four hundred four. Are you DJing at all? A little bit. I've been only really DJing for the last six months or so, just kind oh, of nice. trying to give myself more opportunities to play live. Yeah, yeah, you didn't bring any. You didn't bring DJ gear, did you? I didn't. I have my SP four hundred four in my backpack, but that's it. Oh, that'd be cool. <laughs> Can we um, uh, mess around with that? Uh, possibly. I think I might have forgot cables. Well, I'm, I'm probably. I probably have everything you need. Awesome, dude. That'll be fun. I want to see how this thing works. What are we working on? So I got my SP four hundred four with me. I figured I'd break down a beat. Uh, this one's. Off of the tape I did with Dankery Harv. Amazing. So pretty much I just, it's got two loops that I didn't chop. Pretty much at all. So this is the uh, first loop. And... And then it breaks down to that for the verses. And that's pretty much it. Bounces back and forth between the two loops, but hey, pretty man, much the whole beat. <laughs> Bringing that back real quick. All right. That's dope. Let's keep that rolling. Let's write some hooks. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. 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 Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. 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 Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. 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 And you know how we do it. We keep the movement fluid. You know. 
because the boy is Jewish. I feel like the horns are like they kind of make the party, right? The the horns are, are where it's at. Oh yeah, like I put I use that for the hook because it it feels like the a more it's more full. Is your family still out in York or? Uh yeah, I've been trying to convince my younger brother to move out here since I moved out here, but yeah, everybody is pretty much in York. Yeah, do you have like a feeling of being in Pittsburgh for a while? Or are you thinking in order to make it in music, you have to end up in New York or L.A. or? I mean, I'd love to live in New York. I have some family that lives on Long Island, so yeah. like it would be nice to be able to be close to them. But I love Pittsburgh. Uh, I feel more at home here than I ever did in York. And even if I'm like super successful with music and I can afford to get a place in LA and a place in New York, I'd probably always have a place here too. The South is, is hopping. The, you know, there's a lot of people moving. A lot of people realize that they don't have to go to the office anymore. Oh yeah. And as a music producer, I mean, you're like the ultimate <laughs> in terms of you can live wherever you want, right? In some ways. For the most part, like it's nice to have an active music scene wherever you are just so you have that opportunity close by to participate in it and meet other artists that are doing similar work in similar areas, you know? Yeah. But with the internet, you could really post up in a cabin in the mountains and still have a successful music career. Right. Have you heard of people doing this? I've met a couple people that like do the whole van life thing and yeah, produce a little bit. But my thought is to do not a, like not a, not necessarily a van, but like a RV. That would be that's, cool. That's that's just from festival to festival. <laughs> so it could have a food truck element, it could have a live performance space or yoga space element on the roof maybe. It could have a mobile production studio, so you have the recording studio in it <laughs> as part of it, and then um, you just go from from yoga festival or music festival to music festival, post up in the parking lot, meet people, you know, bring on different yoga teachers, bring on different artists, have a late night party, and and then sell food during the day. <laughs> no, yeah, that would be like the dream. <laughs> I mean, I'm ready. That's <laughs> that's my dream. That's that's one of my business ideas. I have the whole business proposal and everything. Oh, really? Yeah, I've got the whole. Um, you, do you know um, Bamboo? I don't. Yeah, that guy's amazing. He, so, do you know the club Cobra? Yeah, that's his club. Oh, really? Yeah, he's a DJ, but he's also a businessman, an entrepreneur, and he's a genius. Okay. He's a big NFT guy. Interesting style guy. He's got. Um, he's also big into golf and he, ha- he has a food truck called Lumpia Larry's, okay. which is, I guess, um, Filipino cuisine. I think Lumpia is Filipino. So mine isn't, the idea is the concept is meat and fruit. So it's kind of like this, like, um, it's kind of like gluten-free in a way, you know, paleo style. Okay. So kind of th- that would be the idea and i have the whole menu already built out oh nice so it's expensive though is the only issue you know i mean i'm not going to be it's not going to be like burritos like fill y- fill yourself up <laughs> on garbage it's going to be like nice food like yeah it's going to be it's going to be it's amazing but we'll have to see the problem you know i don't know if people at music festivals want to eat ribeye and mango <laughs> but maybe they do we'll see we you just got to find the right music festivals. <laughs> <laughs> well, Coachella, I think I think we're good. Is that kind of like what the the beat event is like? Different people like making beats live, playing the beats together, and people rap over it, or people are just kind of listening to each other making the music and playing the music. Uh, so for the most part, I what I'm trying to do with it is give producers a place to showcase their beats to an audience. Like I feel that they uh, there's not a whole lot of that kind of event happening here yep and uh, like i took a lot of inspiration from like the flip a beat club events and the whole like la beat scene and all the stuff they're doing out there have you been out there and i know what it was like i haven't been like been to la yet but just from seeing 
all the different kind of events and how they've got stuff happening all the time in LA. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's like the. I mean, I guess Mad Lib is. Yeah. Is more. Was he Baltimore? I think he was or, LA. He's one of the LA cats, and then that's like the whole Stones Throw yeah. Peanut Butter Wolf thing, right? Yeah. How they took all Dilla's like unfinished beats and made it into something. Dude, Tanner, that was so much fun, man. Thank you so much for being here and Thanks coming for on. Me. That was really fun. I um, feel like I know a lot more about music production and the community in Pittsburgh, how it works. I hope you blow up. I like your stuff. Thank you. I'll do my best to. Uh, encourage people to listen to it and w- i guess how do they find your um your stuff mostly on spotify uh i'm i got music everywhere you can stream music if you type in no casino you'll find me uh i'm on instagram also no casino amazing i was gonna say um so i had a music uh project i've been on college radio starting when I was at Pitt. So I was on college radio starting in like 2006, 2007. And then I was on with my buddy Carlton Goals. He was one of the first people I met at WPTS, which is the Pitt radio station. Mm -hmm. And he and I had a radio show in Boston called the Sacco and Vanzetti Dance Party. But when he was on WPTS, his show, as far as I know, was called No Steel. Okay. So there's this whole no blank (laughs) thing that you're a part of. Are there any other no's that you know? Uh, not off the top of my head. What about but I no like... ID? Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, I was going to say not off the top of my head, but I know I'm going to be on my way home tonight. And be like, <laughs> that's a no. <laughs> There's no yeses. <laughs> um, sweet. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to be here and um, we'll do it again. Um Next time my freestyles are... I'm going to um, write something so that we can... Uh, uh, do a little collab. Do a collab, <laughs> yes. <laughs>